Lam Ho Yi, better known to her fellow peers at the University of British Columbia and popular culture at large as Elisa Lam, was a bright, thoughtful, and imaginative student. Her interests in fashion and talents for writing were weighed down by the unfortunate demons of bipolar disorder and mental suppression, clouding the circumstances that most assume led to her initial vanishing and tragic death. Amateur sleuths and professional investigators have spent the better part of almost six years digging theoretical tunnels and holding magnifying glasses up to anything and everything that might shed the one decisive clue in the ultimate reason behind Elisa Lam's demise. These probes and perusals, combined with the sorted observational evidence, have only created headaches more than they've solved questions, leaving the uncracked mystery up for grabs by anyone willing to tackle such a brain-bending mind-twister as a hope to provide a more substantial reasoning built upon observable evidence and situational analysis. This is an examination of the bizarre circumstances surrounding Elisa Lam's confusing death. This is Cold Case Detective. Elisa Lam was born on April the 30th, 1991, in Vancouver, British Columbia, to two immigrants from Hong Kong, David and Yina Lam. Her parents opened up a restaurant in Burnaby, Canada, and the family helped operate the popular dining spot called Paul's Restaurant for years. In 2010, Elisa started her first blog on the internet, titled Ether Fields. Throughout the next couple of years, she used the platform to showcase her love for fashion and clothing often posting magazine articles and fashion-related photography. She also would openly speak about her struggles with mental illness, constantly fearing her transcript would show her frequently dropped classes and sporadic college attendance. However, she also wrote honestly about her thoughts and ideas about psychology, emotion, and the human spirit. Throughout these blogs, she kept records of her own musings while sharing stories that reflected a bright mind and an intelligent thinker. Writing in her final blog on Etherfields, Alisa announced that she would be transferring her energy and social media presence to Tumblr, starting a page titled Novelle Nouveau, translated as News New. On her page, Alisa shared thousands of images and pieces of writing, both her own and of various authors. It was apparent on Tumblr that she held deep-rooted interests in classical books and films, experimental art and design, and fashion and culture. Sprinkled amongst these fascinations were bits of dark, brooding images, hinting at a more personal sadness and a conflicted mind, full of monsters, melancholy, and misery. In fact, Elisa did have a history with a couple of psychological disorders. This narrative kept under wraps by her family for months after her disappearance and death. Specifically, she was diagnosed for bipolar disorder and depression, Bipolar disorder is a mental illness that causes depression itself, in addition to instances of abnormal and elevated mood, called mania or hypomania. To treat these disorders, Elisa took multiple medications, such as Dexterin, Welbutrin, and mood stabilizers. For most of her life, Elisa functioned without major ramifications as a result of these struggles. And until the fateful trip to Los Angeles in 2013, she had shown zero signs of breakdown or danger to both herself and others. Despite these characteristics, it's important to remember Elisa Lam as a human being, just as we all are. She was a promising student at the University of British Columbia and obviously had a plethora of ideas about the world. She had a family, a faction of hobbies, and most importantly, a future. Unfortunately, it was cut short of her potential as the mystery of her fate began to unravel in December of 2012. On December the 21st, 2012, Elisa gives the first recorded mention of her desire to travel to the West Coast and visit a school in Santa Clara for potential transfer. A week later, on December the 28th, Elisa mentions on Tumblr that her cell phone has been misplaced. 
After the new year, on January the 5th, 2013, Elisa mentions planning for her West Coast tour, and for the first time, suggests meeting up with people via the internet. A couple of days later, on January the 7th, Elisa books her flight for the West Coast tour, and tacks on a very eerie message regarding the future on Tumblr. Then on January the 9th, Elisa posts on Tumblr that due to paranoia, she has made a new Facebook account for the fifth time, and reposts a blurb she had written earlier that day. Before the blurb is an introduction in which she claims, this is the very start of my depression, and today I am feeling very low. Fast forward to January the 18th, when Elisa supposedly arrives in Vancouver on her tour. Four days later, on January the 22nd, she supposedly travels to San Diego for the first leg in her journey, after missing her initial flight while getting lost in the airport. On January the 24th, Elisa posts on Tumblr that her trip so far has consisted mostly of activities and actions that she participates in back at home on a normal schedule. With this post, she hints at her later actions in Los Angeles, when she says, every now and then, I do something entirely impulsive and reckless. A few days later, on January the 27th, she posts again on Tumblr that she was out with friends at a speakeasy and had in fact lost another phone. Although this time, it did not belong to her. Instead, she had borrowed her friend's old Blackberry for her trip. The next day, January the 28th, Elisa arrives in LA and checks into the Cecil Hotel near Skid Row a budget motel for tourists in the city. On January the 30th, Elisa's anonymous roommates complain of her odd behavior, and she is moved to a private room on the fifth floor so that she isn't a disturbance to other guests. On January the 31st, the last day of her planned visit in Los Angeles, Elisa is seen for the last time by a couple of anonymous hotel workers, and then finally by a clerk, Katie Orphan, at the local bookstore. Katie mentions Elisa was by herself, but also outgoing, very lively, and very friendly. Orphan also says that she was talking about what book she was getting, and whether or not what she was getting would be too heavy for her to carry around as she travelled. Because Elisa was supposed to check out at the Cecil Hotel that day, and travel to Santa Cruz for the last leg on her tour, both her parents were waiting for a phone call. In fact, Elisa had called her parents almost every night during her trip, despite losing her temporary cell phone. After they heard nothing from their daughter, Mr. and Mrs. Lamb flew to Los Angeles to file a missing persons report, and assist the Los Angeles Police Department in their search. Throughout the first week of February, both the Lamb couple and Ali PD scoured the Cecil and the surrounding areas for any trace of Elisa. Police dogs were unable to pick up on her scent, and for the first few days, no clues were uncovered. Elisa's room that she stayed in prior to her disappearance was void of any suspicious items or sign of disturbances, an unsettling occurrence for such a strange vanishing. On February the 6th, the LAPD released an official statement online regarding Elisa Lamb's disappearance, and details surrounding the case, urging citizens to keep an eye out for her profile. A day later, they hold a press conference on February the 7th, but again receive no leads or calls from the general public. Then on February the 14th, LAPD releases the biggest bombshell in the entire case. An elevator surveillance clip from February the 1st, showing Elisa Lam walk in the elevator, press a series of buttons, and proceed to act in a bizarre manner. The clip was unsettling to say the least, but gave investigators one more glimpse into Lamb's final sighting, and brought the case to worldwide interests. The missing person search would soon come to an end, however, when on February the 19th, Cecil Hotel workers responded to multiple guest complaints about funny smelling water and low faucet pressure. The employee went up to the rooftop water system, peered into an open tank, and discovered Elisa Lamb's naked body floating face up. LAPD was immediately notified, and the water tanks soon became a crime scene. A couple of days thereafter, on February the 21st, the Los Angeles Coroner's Office issued a label of a lamb's demise as accidental, due to the consequence of drowning, with bipolar disorder as a finding of other conditions contributing, but not related to, the immediate cause of death. On June of 2013, the full coroner's report, along with the toxicology results, were released to the public as well. 
While not revealing any massive twist to the mystery, it did note that Elisa Lam's body was indeed found naked, with her clothes also found in the water tank, discovered in a sandy particulate along with her keys and watch. From here on out, thousands of theories, hypotheticals, conspiracies, and simple casual conversations have been discussed through the following months and years. Nobody seems to want to stick by the Alley Coroner's office and their findings. Many questioned the police investigation, and even more saw possible holes in their final report. Regardless, the timeline of Elisa Lam's death and its direct series of events blossomed into the most talked about case of the 21st century. Without a doubt, the most controversial and scrutinized piece of the Elisa Lam's case is the four minute CCTV footage that the LAPD pulled from one of Cecil Hotel's surveillance tapes. Situated in the upper corner of a main elevator carriage in the Northern Corridor, before we dive into its content, let's watch the main portion of the video. Be warned, the following images are unsettling and could be viewed as sensitive material. The video is a bit grainy, and segments of it are hard to clearly make out. But one thing is for certain, Elisa Lam is the subject of the footage, and is clearly reacting to something. Now what that something is, will probably never be accounted for with 100% certainty, but it sure does make the clip that much stranger. It really makes you wonder, is Elisa peering out of the elevator with the sense that she's being followed? One could argue she's talking out loud at certain points, possibly just to herself. Between the random buttons pressed upon her entrance, to the emptiness of the hallways, to the undistinguished hand gestures and body positions she makes, the rhyme and reason to the video is impossible to explain upon the first watch. There has also been some controversy revolving around the tape's origins. Some people across the internet claim the footage skips one minute of the timecode, but because of its low quality, it's not easy to point out. Others say that the footage itself has been tampered with, purposefully pixelating Elisa's mouth at various points, but these reports have been either denied or flat out ignored by professionals. One thing is for sure, the elevator footage from February the 1st, 2013, depicting the last known images of Elisa Lam, have conjured both worthy concern and far-fetched conspiracies and remains the single most interesting piece of evidence linked to the entire case. Since the day Elisa Lam went missing, the CCTV tapes were released, and her body was discovered on the rooftop of the Cecil Hotel. Countless theories have been proposed across the internet and publications all over the world, trying to unlock the secrets of the seemingly unexplainable mystery. Many of these assumptions are based purely in conspiracy theory. Some circles have drawn up wild fantasies that explain Elisa was playing an elevator game, attempting to cross over into alternative universes. Others believe Elisa was possessed by spiritual forces, encountered paranormal subjects, or was contacted by otherworldly beings. These farcical attempts to glamorize Elisa's death as science fiction or occultists are based upon zero observational evidence connected by complex, coincidental claims and hyperbole. For example, the location of the Cecil Hotel is in Skid Row of downtown Los Angeles. This area is infamous for its high crime rates and suspicious activity. Drug peddling and violent crime are common both outside and inside of the hotel, which has its own history of murder and suicide. In 1985, serial killer Richard Ramirez, dubbed as the Night Stalker, stayed in one of the 600 rooms in the midst of horrifically killing 13 women. Another homicide suspect, Jack Unterviga, stayed in the hotel in 1991. It was a frequent spot for those with suicidal tendencies, seeing a few people jump from the rooftop in the 1950s and 60s. It even housed another cold case, 
that of Pigeon Goldie Osgood, a former telephone operator whose mutilated body was discovered in her room in 1964, and whose death remains unsolved. Despite the criminology of the Cecil, none of it can be directly attributed to the tragic death of Elisa. A much more real explanation is that Elisa Lam was followed during her time in Los Angeles, chased in the hallways of the Cecil Hotel, and subsequently murdered and placed in the water tank by a second party. Initially, this theory made sense. If you go back to multiple Tumblr posts that Elisa made throughout the end of 2012 and beginning of 2013, she was conscious about her outspoken nature and feared that one day her mouth would get her into trouble. At various points, she wrote about unsettling anxieties. One post read, I'm going out tonight, I really hope no creeper comes near me. And twice, Elisa was convinced trouble was lurking around the corner at the fault of her tongue saying, I really need to be removed from society before my big mouth gets me in trouble and I get beaten up, as well as, my mouth is my downfall and it will get me in trouble. I already do so many stupid things, I have troubles knowing where the boundaries are, and it seems I always make the biggest mistakes at the worst possible moments, and get caught and face consequences for getting caught the one time I wasn't thinking, and did something stupid to cut corners. So taking into consideration, she repeatedly sparked the fuses of strangers around her. It's plausible she did it in the wrong place at the wrong time that winter. In addition to Elisa's worries is the manner in how she acted during the elevator footage. After she enters for the first time and presses the floor buttons, she waits a few moments before quickly approaching the elevator's doorframe. She then quickly sticks her head out into the hallway and glances from side to side in a hurried manner then pulling back into the elevator. She pins herself against the wall and then into the corner, acting as if she was avoiding the vision of someone from outside. She goes back to the doorframe once more and again cautiously sticks her head into the open. From here, she makes a series of random movements before pressing more buttons. When she returns outside for the final time, it appears as if she is communicating either orally or with her hands. Regardless, no one is seen and Elisa disappears from view. The first part of her movements could indicate she was hiding from another person, but her random footwork and dazed demeanor in the second part of the footage just doesn't make sense if she truly was on the run. The Tumblr post concerns combined with the suspicious video truly makes you wonder if there was someone involved with Elisa's death, but there are too many rebuttals to the argument that her cause of death was a homicide. For instance, there were zero bruises or signs of bodily harm on Elisa's figure, ruling out an assault. All of her belongings were accounted for besides the long lost cell phone, ruling out a robbery or attempted robbery. The eyewitness testimonies by hotel employees and the bookstore clerk claimed she was completely alone and showed no sign of struggle or distress regarding another person. Cameras captured no other suspects around the time of Elisa's recording and her lack of relationships in a new territory helped rule out a planned or gestated murder, as she had very little friends back at home, let alone Los Angeles. In the end, there was zero evidence confirming the theories about murder or foul play, leading both the LAPD and us to rule it out. All of that being said, the official opinion of the LA Chief Coroner and assigned medical examiners presents a Catch-22. They preface their final hypothesis with a warning that the interpretation of the evidence is limited because of the small sample size, particularly the lack of blood samples tested due to low levels. However, they then contradicted themselves when they say that the police investigation ruled out foul play, but also stated a full review of the circumstances of the case and appropriate consultation do not support intent to harm oneself. The manner of death is classified as accident. So if there was no harmful intention, either by Lam herself or a second suspect, then how exactly did Elisa Lam accidentally climb up a massive cylinder, discover it was the water tank, lift up an incredibly heavy lid and jump into the dark water? And if the lid was already opened, why did she choose to climb in as a response? Murder and suicide are polar opposites that have been deemed inapplicable. Believers that Elisa was killed by someone else linger over the fact that the rooftop access was protected by alarms on the doors, 
and the fact that accessing the water tanks required agility and strength. However, it's been repeatedly explained that the hotel has four different access points to the roof, three by fire escape that have no alarms, and that the water tank lids were either opened or lighter than originally assumed, easily operated by a woman of Elisa's size. So now we must find the middle ground between the two explanations and justifiably theorize how such a specific, unarguable set of circumstances can be regarded as an accident. The most plausible and evidential theory is that Elisa Lam suffered from a manic episode due to her struggles with bipolar disorder, both leading up to and on the day of February the 1st. To start, we must consider the toxicology reports. Two different antidepressant medicines prescribed to Elisa were either traced directly or metabolites were traced to her heart blood and liver enzymes. One of these drugs was bupropion, known to sometimes cause mania in bipolar disorder. Another mood stabilizing medicine had metabolites traced to her enzymes, but Elisa's antipsychotic medicine was not found in her system. So in review, Elisa had only taken one of her prescribed drugs the day she passed, and had only taken the others recently, if not at all, in the days leading up to her death. The toxicology report also confirmed that Elisa had no alcohol in her system or other recreational drugs, this rules out the possibility that she had been under the influence of substances while on camera in the elevator, or that something such as pills or drunkenness inspired her to climb into the water tanks. Her liver was not tested for a hypnol, better known as roofies. There was no urine in the system, meaning she excreted any and all liquid waste urine that would contain traces of roofies, ketamine, or other date rape paraphernalia. So reflecting on the information regarding her history with mental disorders and the calculated prescription use and lack thereof, we must next understand what exactly an episode of mania is. Severe mania can include psychotic features such as hallucinations, delusions, paranoia, catatonia, and lack of insight. One mental health professional uses the phrase, disorganized yet appearing singularly focused highlighting its occurrence when Elisa presses the buttons in the elevator at random, appearing intent on some kind of agenda or direction. Symptoms of mania also include psychomotor agitation, which involves repetitive, purposeless, or unintentional movements and behaviors. These movements and behaviors are made in response to feelings of restlessness caused by increased anxiety. Dr. Daniel Morrell reviews in a medical journal that these actions can result in wringing of the hands, pacing, and taking off clothes repeatedly. All three behaviors were exhibited by Elisa, both in the elevator footage and in or around the water tanks. The fact that Elisa Lam attempted to go to the roof at all could be a response to hallucinations and or delusions. What these might have been are unknown, and it would be unfair to Elisa's memory to assume and fictionalize her mental illness. It's important to note that manic hallucinations are not just visual, but can be manifestations of sound, smell, taste, and touch, another possible explanation to her removal of clothing. In combination with the inconsistent prescription upkeep, the pure fact that Elisa was in a foreign location with a lack of communication back home could have set off a manic episode. The people Elisa had been staying with, since she booked a shared room with fellow guests, stated that Elisa was acting strangely, to the point she was bothering the others and had to be moved to another room by herself. The additional trigger of isolation could have initiated mania, as well as playing a role by why she was by herself for the remainder of her time in LA. The last bit of promising evidence supporting this theory is a testimony received by us from a confidential resident to be referenced as Resident A from Los Angeles, California, who wishes for both them and their family to be kept anonymous. After hearing about our investigation into the case of Elisa Lam, and having little to no prior knowledge of this scenario, Resident A told us that a few years ago, they had a family member in Mexico commit suicide as a result of manic depression or bipolar disorder. Resident A stated that this family member died from drowning after plunging into the depths of a similar industrial water tank. Resident A also stated that this was a common occurrence for the family member, who as a result of their bipolar disorder, seeked out bodies of water whenever suffering from a bout of mania. 
Resident A confirmed that this family member was about 35 years old when they passed away, but had been suffering from mental illness for over a decade, and had an inclination to run away and find attraction to water throughout the years. While this case has no direct relation to Elisa Lam, it's peculiar that both instances involve a confined bipolar subject, who as a result of their condition, drowned because of an unconscious gravitation to H2O. There is hardly any research done in the medical or psychological field regarding this phenomena, but we are incredibly interested if there are other situations like this one. If anything, it further confirms that Elisa's reason for selecting the Cecil Hotel's water tank to not be a mystery, but a tragic symptom of her psychological illness. In the end, taking all evidence, scientific research, and societal patterns into account, we've determined that the initial report from the chief coroner is accurate, in that Elisa Lam died accidentally due to drowning, as an indirect result of bipolar disorder. While other theories were briefly discussed, their complete lack in observational evidence and origins from make-believe prevented them from serious consideration. The reason this case fascinates followers all over the world and produced incessant gossip and conspiracies is the fact that it's hard for people to accept simple, innocent explanations for complex and unsettling situations. Psychological disorders are heavily stigmatized, but also very misunderstood. People do not want to accept that Elisa Lam was suffering from hallucinations due to bipolar disorder, because that's only in her mind, and they struggle accepting such indistinction. Instead, it's much easier to tell our own versions of what we want to have happened, something far more fantastical or intriguing than mental illness. For example, people believe another party was involved because Lam's cell phone was missing, and her tumbler remained active for months following her death. Yet the simple answer is her original phone was lost weeks before her trip, and Tumblr will populate active accounts with posts in the likeness of their previous content for a brief time after they go dark. People also couldn't wrap their brains around the fact that Elisa made it to the rooftop and into the water tanks undetected. However, it's quite simply laid out in the Undisputed Material Facts and Supporting Evidence section of the Motion for Summary Judgment document after the Cecil Hotel was sued for its role in Elisa's death. In box 10, it states that the rooftop access door is equipped with an electronic alarm system, which alerts hotel employees when the rooftop access door has been opened. Followed by box 14, that states, the alarm for the rooftop access door was not activated at any point in January or February 2013. This means that Elisa used one of the three fire escapes to reach the rooftop proven possibly by an intentional guest at the Cecil Hotel via a YouTube demonstration. In addition, the motion for summary judgment reports in box 20 that someone could theoretically access the water tank by climbing to the top of an elevator utility room and jumping down upon the water tank from above. This photo depicts the elevator utility room in question, which allows easy access from a red set of stairs and a joined ladder. The leap from that structure to the water tanks is also quite negligible, as seen put to scale with the size of a human portrayed here. In terms of the elevator video, our story-centric minds want to fill in the hallways on either side of that elevator full of monsters and perpetrators and supernatural phenomena. But in reality, there was nothing of the sort the night of February 1st, 2013. Only Elisa Lam truly knows what she saw and what she felt the day she died and it's up to us to trust that it was the unfortunate unpredictability of mental illness that caused those emotions and the actions that resulted from such. After all, Elisa was a young woman who had recently gone through intense emotional roller coasters with an identity crisis and building anxieties revolving around her purpose in life. She was somewhat aware of this impending depression and admitted online that she could tell she was leaning towards impulsive and reckless tendencies after the fact a glaring sign of potential mania. She was about the age that many young people start to experience what are called breakthrough symptoms of both bipolar spectrum and schizophrenia spectrum tendencies. The unfamiliar surroundings of Skid Row, Los Angeles, potential insomnia, mixed with an absence of proper medicine, compounded her confusion and eventual mania. There is no one ruling factor that led to Elisa Lam's harrowing, misfortunate death. Instead, it was a combination of nature and circumstance, heightened by coincidental video recordings, that cultivated a gross amount of inconsiderate internet conspiracy. 
Let this examination of the bizarre circumstances surrounding Ali Salam's death be a step in the process of ending stigmatization around her struggles with disorder and mental illness in general. Alisa was a beautiful human being with unlimited potential. She had interests and hobbies and dislikes like all of us do. She has a family who still honor her memory. It's time for us to do the same and take lessons from her illustration. Look after those with mental health issues and speak up about it before it creates another confusing saga like that of Elisa Lam 